Hello everyone! In this lecture, we will continue with smart cards topic. We will discuss smart card security and we will study the Java card technology. Let's start with the smart card security model. Uh, whenever we are analyzing the security of a smart card based system, we have to realize that, as a rule, there are several parties involved in a smart card based system. These are first, a cardholder to whom the card has been issued. This can be the legitimate cardholder or an illegitimate user who has access to the card, who physically holds the card. Then we have a data owner for the data that is stored on the card. Sometimes the data is owned by the cardholder, but quite frequently it is owned by the card issuer. We will see some examples later. Then we have a terminal and the terminal owner. The terminal is the device which communicates with the card. The terminal owner can be the cardholder or some third party. For example, when using a smart card to pay in a shop, in this case, some random merchant is the terminal owner. Then we have a card issuer, the party who issued the card to the cardholder. And then we have a card manufacturer and card software manufacturer. Card issuers rarely manufacture the cards themselves, so cards are usually manufactured by third parties. Now, these parties listed here can have quite different interests, and therefore they may be willing to attack each other. In fact, if we look at any smart card deployment, we will see that the smart card is used exactly for the reason to protect one party from the other. If all these parties mutually trusted each other, then there would be no need to use a smart card. A simple USB stick would suffice to carry the data around. So, when we analyze the security of a smart card based system, there is a list of possible attacks that we have to consider. Attacks by the terminal against the cardholder, attacks by the cardholder against the terminal, and so on. Bruce Schneier has a nice paper from the 90s about modeling the security threats in smart card based systems. Uh, you can find it here. Now, let's try to apply this model to the most popular smart card use cases to analyze what the potential attacks are and whether they are prevented by the use of a smart card. Let's start with the Estonian ID card. The Estonian ID card is a very interesting smart card use case here in Estonia. First, what is the smart card here used for? Mainly, it is used to store ECC private keys, to perform on-card signing decryption, and before performing cryptographic operations, authorize the cardholder using the PIN code security mechanism. Now, who are the parties involved here? We have a cardholder, who hopefully is the person in whose name the card has been issued. But who is the date owner here? Who owns the private keys? The state or the cardholder? Since the keys are used to make digital signatures, the owner of the private key should be the cardholder and not the state. So I would tend to agree that the cardholder is the one who owns the data. But interestingly enough, even the cardholder is not allowed to see the data, to make copies of the private key. And this restriction is here to benefit the cardholder, because if the cardholder could copy these keys, they would probably end up on the internet, in GitHub or wherever, right? So here, the smart card protects the cardholder against himself as well. Now, who is the terminal owner? Uh, this actually depends on the use case. If you are using the ID card in your computer, then you are the terminal owner. Unless, of course, your computer is hacked by someone, in which case uh, we could say that, that someone owns the terminal. Similarly, when you are using your ID card as a loyalty card, you are inserting it in a terminal owned by someone else. And this is actually very similar to inserting your ID card in a computer that has been hacked by some attacker. Then, who is the card issuer? The card issuer here is the state in the form of the police and border guard board. The card manufacturer and card software manufacturer for the latest generation ID cards is Edemia. The chip has been manufactured by NXP. Now, what are the attacks? What are the possible attacks by the terminal against the cardholder who is using the card in the terminal? Uh, what if the computer in which you use your ID card is hacked? What are the risks? The attacker cannot obtain the private key, 
because the smart card is an HSM. However, the attacker can forge some signatures. The attacker needs the PIN code, but that can be easily obtained using a keylogger, for example. There are exit smart card readers with a PIN pad, such as this one. A PIN code that is entered on this PIN pad is sent directly to the chip, bypassing the computer, so that even if the computer is compromised, the attacker cannot learn the entered PIN code. There are different types of PIN pad readers. Uh, this one will allow the PIN to be entered either on a computer or on the PIN pad. Um, this black one has a feature called PIN firewall. This reader will allow the PIN to be entered only on the PIN pad. If the computer sends PIN verification APDUs, these APDUs will be simply blocked by the reader. And this is the reason why, if you are using this smart card reader, you cannot see the PIN retry counter for the latest generation ID cards, because these empty verify commands are simply blocked by the reader. So, this reader prevents the use of the PIN code even if the attacker somehow learns it. For example, by turning on the web camera and seeing the PIN you entered on the PIN pad. Uh, then there are these smart card readers built into a keyboard, where the number keypad here uh, can be used as a PIN pad, sending the PIN directly to the card. A couple of years ago, it was discovered that these keyboards were flawed. The key presses uh, pressed here on the numeric pad are sent directly to the smart card, but also over USB to the computer, just that the driver installed on the computer ignores these pin pad key presses. So these keyboards actually do not provide any additional security against the compromised computer. Now, even if you use this pin pad reader with the pin firewall, the attacker can still forge signatures. Do you have an idea how? The problem with pinpad readers is that they do not contain a trusted screen where it would be possible to see what is being signed. So the malware on our computer can simply replace the transaction we are signing with some other data. Ah yes, we will receive an error message that signing failed, but who cares, we see error messages every day. We would try again, but this time the malware would not intervene when we would get a valid signature for the data we wanted to sign. So, while these pin pad readers help a bit, they do make life for the attacker harder, they unfortunately do not completely solve the security risk of a compromised computer. So, it is still crucial for the computer in which we use our ID card to not be compromised. Now, what about using the ID card in the terminals installed in, for example, Shop Prisma, where the clients insert their ID cards to collect loyalty points? Can the terminal attack the cardholder somehow? Well, fortunately, we are not required to enter our PIN code here, so these terminals cannot forge our signature. These terminals are simply reading our personal identification code stored in the personal data file, the same as you did in the last homework. In fact, there is no way for the terminal to verify authenticity of the data it reads from the personal data file. And this leads to the next attack class, the attacks by the cardholder against the terminal. So here, a malicious cardholder could insert a card that contains false data in the personal data file, and the terminal has no way to cryptographically verify it. In this lecture, we will learn how to write our own smart card applications. So we can write an applet that emulates the Estonian ID card and contains any data in the personal data file we want. And we can go in further we can transplant the chip from the programmable smart card to a genuine Estonian ID card, as you see here. And this will not damage any physical security features on the genuine ID card. Uh, we did some experiments a few years ago where we built an ID card emulator that logged the APDUs that the terminal sent to it. We used our ID card emulator in different terminals in Estonia and observed what data the terminals tried to read from the card. It turned out that the majority of the terminals read the entire personal data file, despite the fact that it is enough to read only the personal identification code to identify the cardholder. Of course, uh, we don't know whether uh, that data is stored and processed in the backend systems. Anyhow, as you see, in this use case, the attacks by the cardholder against the terminal owner are possible. Now, what about the attacks by the cardholder against the data owner? 
Well, the cardholder and the data owner is the same entity, so there should be no interest in attacking ourselves. However, we may want to read out our private keys. Could we, as the cardholders, attack the card somehow to extract the private keys? Well, that is believed to be infeasible in practice, but we will discuss possible attacks after a few slides. What about the issuer against the cardholder? The issuer can always attack. The issuer can issue an ID card that has our name on it to some other person or abuse the cards before they are given out to the cardholder. Uh, what about the hardware software manufacturer of the card? Since this party here generates the keys, the biggest risk is that the private keys could be simply copied off the card after they are generated. Alternatively, the card manufacturer could implement key generation that uses bad randomness, so that private keys could be recovered afterwards. Or simply put a backdoor in the card such that if a magic APD is sent to the card, the card dumps its memory where the private keys are stored. Uh, can we detect such a backdoor somehow? Not really, because the smart card chip is a black box that has been designed exactly for the purpose that it should be impossible to reverse engineer and audit it. So this is where we have to blindly trust a lot of entities involved in the smart card production chain. And if you remember Infineon's RSA key generation flaw in the previous generation Estonian ID cards, uh, there were some theories that it was not a flaw, but a well-designed backdoor. So go figure. All right, uh, let's look now at a few more smart card use cases. Payment cards, SIM cards, and pay TV. Payment cards. Payment cards is a very popular smart card use case. Each and every one of you should have one in your wallet. The standard is called EMV, which stands for Europe, MasterCard and Visa, as these three companies created the standard. What it is used for? It is used to store a symmetric MAC key, which is used to authenticate or sign the transactions, and also to enforce cardholder authentication using the PIN mechanism. The use of a PIN verification mechanism is very popular for the cards issued by European banks, but in the United States, the PIN verification mechanism is not used. There, paper signatures are used for cardholder verification, uh, which are pretty useless because nobody compares them in practice. The banks in the US have chosen to drop the PIN verification requirement in order to provide better convenience to their clients. Um, you may remember that initially payment cards did not have a smart card chip, but had a magnetic stripe, which provided no security as the data from the magnetic stripe could be easily read and cards cloned. So, according to the banks, most fraud was caused by clone cards, uh, which has now been prevented after introducing the chip. According to their risk analysis, the risk of cloning is much bigger than the risk of using a stolen or lost card. So, the cardholder authentication feature might be less important than we may think. And we also see that here in Europe, banks have removed the PIN verification requirement for contactless payments under 50 or so euros. So, Apparently, fraud that involves unauthorized use of the card is not that significant. So, what attacks can we think of? Uh, what about the attacks by the terminal against the cardholder? What could a malicious terminal do? A malicious terminal cannot copy the data from the chip to clone it, because the symmetric transaction key cannot be read from the card. Uh, what a malicious terminal can do is that it can keylog the PIN codes. Now, these devices are not supposed to store the entered PIN codes, but they could be modified to store them. Uh, for example, uh, here we can see a payment terminal that has been modified to play Tetris. The terminal could also be modified to show one purchase amount on the screen, but bill for another. But uh, such cheating, of course, would be rather quickly detected by the customers. Then there is one neat attack that is quite hard to prevent. It is called the relay attack. Uh, here is how it works. Um, there is a malicious terminal that has been modified to relay communication via fake smart card to a legitimate terminal. So when this fake smart card is inserted in the terminal, the terminal actually communicates 
with the payment card that is inserted into this fake terminal. So let's say Alice wants to buy an ice cream on a street, paying for it with a payment card. Alice puts her card in Bob's malicious terminal and is asked to enter the PIN code to pay $20. In reality, the commands received by her, pay by her payment card are received over the internet from another terminal where Bob's co-conspirator Carol is asked to enter her payment card to buy expensive jewelry. So by confirming this $20 transaction, Alice has actually paid for an expensive piece of jewelry that Carol has purchased. Quite a clever attack. Now, the distance here can be hundreds of kilometers. The fake and the legitimate terminals can even be in different countries. Uh, here is how the fake card used in a relay attack could look. So the card actually does not have a smart card chip, but a wire that is connected to the place where the chip contact should be. This way, the communication can be relayed to the victim's card that is placed in the fake terminal. Now, how would we detect this relay attack? Probably by looking at the transaction history, Alice. Uh, uh, would have to figure out that at the time she allegedly paid $2,000 for the jewelry, she actually purchased ice cream and traced down the guy who sold the ice cream or traced down the person who bought the jewelry. Uh, this can be challenging. Now, having a banking app in our phone that immediately notifies us about each transaction made with our payment card may help here, right? Uh, relay attacks are almost impossible to print, but fortunately, we have not seen this type of attack being exploited at large in the context of payment cards. Uh, what about the attacks by the terminal owner against this issuer? A malicious terminal owner could claim to a bank that the bank's client X was here and purchased some goods, asking the bank to pay out to the merchant the money. However, the merchant cannot do this because the merchant cannot show an authorized transaction unless the card holder was indeed, or unless the card was indeed used to make such a transaction. Uh, can you think of any attack by the issuer against the card holder? Well, the issuer, the bank, holds all the money owned by the card holder, so the bank can always rob their clients, but such a bank would quickly go bankrupt, I suppose. There are more refined ways by which the bank could attack the card holder. The bank or their employees could sell these Mac keys to fraudsters. And then, when the account of the cardholder is emptied, claim that the cardholder is at fault. Claim that the cardholder acted negligently, giving their card and pins to fraudsters. Uh, this type of fraud we don't see in Europe, because here the bank eats all the risks. The bank has to either prove that this was indeed the cardholder who made the turn payment or refund the payment. But in other countries, uh, this may be a problem, especially for business clients in the US, where they don't have these protections. The next significant smart card use case is mobile phone SIM cards. SIM here stands for Subscriber Identity Module. What is a SIM card used for? It is used to store a 128-bit symmetric subscriber authentication key. This is the main purpose of the card, to authenticate the subscriber, because mobile phones are all the same and they do not contain any secret that could be used to authenticate a specific user or subscriber. Uh, this key is also used to, to derive a session key using the RunGSM algorithm command. The session key, in turn, is used to encrypt and decrypt voice calls using some stream cipher. Uh, then it implements cardholder verification using the PIN code mechanism. In addition, historically, SIM cards had been a very important function of storing contact information, phone numbers, and SMS messages. Uh, today, the contacts and SMSs are stored in the device or in the cloud because smart cards provide a rather limited storage space. Um, you may have seen this neat device which can be used to backup and restore phone contacts on a SIM card. We can insert a SIM card here, it reads the contact information to its internal storage and is able to write the contact information back to another SIM card. In fact, by now you should have enough skills to implement such functionality using a standard smart card reader 
and Python code. Contacts are stored on a smart card file system in elementary files, which should be trivial to read and write. The SIM card chip also stores the operator information and other set settings. Uh, for example, in case of roaming, the SIM card can store information on which mobile operator's network to prefer, and so on. In Estonia, the SIM card can also implement the mobile ID functionality. Uh, here, similarly to the ID card, the SIM card stores two asymmetry key pairs for authentication and digital signing. The data to be signed is sent to a SIM card over SMS. After the user enters the PIN, the SIM card signs the data, uh, sends the signature over SMS back to the mobile ID service, and then the mobile ID service sends it back to the relying party that requested the signature. What about the attacks? Uh, what are the, the attacks by the card holder against the data owner? Uh, first of all, who do you think owns the data on the card? Well, for contacts and SMS messages, it is probably cardholder. For the subscriber authentication key, the owner could be the issuer, because this is the data that the issuer uses to authenticate the customer. But that's debatable, as you could also say that you own the key because you are billed for the actions initiated with that key, right? About uh, 15 years ago, SIM cards had a flaw that could be exploited to extract the symmetric key and clone SIM cards. Uh, today, a stronger algorithm is used and it is not possible anymore to extract these keys, at least not trivially. What about the attacks by the terminal owner against the issuer? Well, uh, there is not much a malicious phone could do, because the issuer does not have to trust the phone here. What about the attacks by the issuer against the cardholder? A mobile operator could bill the client more than the client has used its services, but uh, nobody would use such a mobile operator, I guess. A malicious mobile operator could give the subscriber authentication key to third parties so that these parties could eavesdrop on communication, for example. Uh, I have read that uh, law enforcement authorities can obtain the book code from the mobile operator to access contacts and SMS messages on a seized SIM card, but uh, that's probably not too useful nowadays. Pay TV is a smart card use case that historically has contributed a lot to improve the security of smart card microcontrollers. Uh, this use case is a bit outdated uh, due to internet penetration, uh, but maybe you have seen these TV decoders which require some sort of smart card to be inserted. If you want to watch television, you have to regularly purchase a new smart card. The smart card here is used to decrypt TV signals and store channel filters. The idea is that satellites broadcast TV signals to everyone, but the keyframes, which are crucial to see the picture, are encrypted. The decoder would send these keyframes to the smart card, and the card would then decrypt them. The card can also contain channel filters. For example, there can be flags in the card which specify which channels the card is allowed to decrypt. If you pay more, you can get a smart card with less restrictions. Now, the attacks here are obvious. The attack by the cardholder against the data owner issuer would be to clone the card and to sell them for a discounted price to others, right? In this use case, an attacker can buy the card and have all the time in their hands needed to compromise the card. There was a huge commercial interest by pirates to clone the chips, and in the early days they were often su successful. So. This pushed the pay TV industry to increase the security of these chips, and as a result, today we have security chips that are very hard to compromise. Are there any attacks by the terminal against the issuer? Well, the terminal does not have access to any keys because they are in the smart card. However, the terminal does get access to decrypted keyframes. So the attack is that we could modify the decoder connect it to the internet and make some online service where people in real time can download the decrypted keyframes. So this way, only the keyframes need to be downloaded from the internet, the other video data can be obtained from the air for free. But of course, if the internet is super fast, we could instead simply stream the video over the internet. 
uh, let's take a look at the most popular attacks against smart cards. So there are several types of attacks that can be used to extract the information that a smart card tries to protect so hard. The first class of attacks is sidechannel attacks. These are completely passive attacks. Through timing analysis, we can see how much time it takes for a smart card to execute some operation. If this is a badly implemented pin comparison, we may learn whether the first character of the pin was correct. If it is a badly implemented modular exponentiation, we may learn how many zeros and one bits are in the secret exponent, and so on. Uh, then a very powerful technique is power analysis. As you know, smart cards do not have a built-in power supply. They receive power from a terminal. The terminal can measure how much current the card is consuming at a particular point in time and use this information to infer what the card is doing. Uh, for example, for the early smart card technologies, a power trace could be used to trivially read out zeros and ones written in the card's memory, because to write a bit with value 1 required more power than to write a zero bit. Protection against uh, power analysis has improved, so what you vendors can do is to in introduce some background noise or activity when the CPU is inactive. Uh, however, if you looked at the power trace from modern cards, it would still be possible to say that, let's say, this is APDU parsing, these peaks are a modular exponentiation, here the padding is removed, and so on. Uh, here you can see a power trace from the previous generation Estonian ID card. It shows the power consumption when the terminal tried to establish a secure channel with the card. As you see, some patterns are clearly visible and it should be possible to attribute each peak to some specific type of operation. So this power analysis technique is very efficient, effective even today. If we had access to a chip platform and we could run our own code on it, we could create a power trace pattern for all types of operations. Then, if we were given an unknown power trace from that chip platform, we could apply the, some machine learning techniques and deduce from the power trace what instructions the smart card is executing. And this is very powerful. So, uh, these were passive attacks. Uh, then there are active attacks. Uh, for example, fault injection, where the goal is to introduce faults in the code execution. For instance, if we could introduce some bit error such that some pointer in the memory gets corrupted, then, as a result of the, fa of the fault, the card could return some secret data, for example, a private key to the terminal. So you see the implications here. To introduce such faults, the attacker can manipulate the voltage and clock rate supply to the chip or induce electromagnet radiation in hopes that some bit errors will be introduced. Uh, since these type of attacks are feasible in practice, the recommendation of chip vendors is to program smart cards assuming that an attacker can introduce a single fault. Uh, this means that the code running on the card should check critical conditions twice. So you would have an if condition, and then inside the if condition, another if condition, which rechecks if the initial condition is still true. Uh, then there are brutal physical attacks, which involve chemical etching, taking layer by layer off in order to reverse engineer the entire circuit, chip rewiring, adding a track, and cutting a track. Now, these attacks require expensive laboratory equipment skills and patience. And then there are a bunch of countermeasures that chip vendors try to apply. Adding metal layers, adding onboard sensors, temperature, light frequency that if triggered react and destroy the data in the memory. And so on. So this is a cat and mouse game here. Now these first two types of attacks, side channel attacks, and fault injection attacks are partly algorithmic attacks and therefore it is partly the responsibility of software developers to implement measures against these attacks. For physical attacks we have to hope that the chip manufacturer has implemented measures that complicate these attacks. Uh, let's have a brief overview of the common criteria security certification scheme. Uh, 
Uh, this certification scheme is used to prove security of smart card products and other hardware security modules. Uh, briefly, this is how it works. In the common criteria terminology, there is some target of evaluation, some product that has to be evaluated. Usually, the industry will write a lengthy document called Protection Profile, which identifies security requirements for a class of products. Uh, for example, uh, there is a standardized protection profile for secure signature creation devices that is referenced in the EIDAS regulation. Uh, then the vendor of the product will write a document called Security Target, specifying what security properties and functions their product aims to achieve. The certification of a product will target some specific evaluation assurance level. Uh, this is a level from 1 to 7, specifying how extensively the product has been verified. For example, level 1 only assures that the product functions in a manner consistent with its documentation, while level 7 requires a formal verified design and testing. In the evaluation, it is possible to include some assurance requirements from a higher assurance level. Uh, this is called augmentation, and in such cases, the assurance level will have the plus sign attached. A smart card products are usually augmented by including vulnerability assessment assurance from a higher assurance level. Uh, what you should realize is that the assurance level does not give an idea of how secure the product is, but only to what extent the security claims of the security target were verified. A good example here is Microsoft Windows XP operating system that has been evaluated according to Evaluation Assurance Level 4. However, if you take a look at the security target, we will find that for the security claims to hold, the computer running Windows XP has to be disconnected from a network. So what is meant by the term secure here is actually answered by this security target document here. Now, to initiate the evaluation process, the vendor of the product will approach an evaluation facility, which is a certified IT security testing laboratory. Here, the security claims made by the vendor will be evaluated by an independent party. Well, actually, it is not that independent in practice because the vendor is the one who pays for this evaluation. The vendor will submit their product and all the documentation to an evaluation facility, sometimes even the source code and hardware design, uh, depending on the level of verification the vendor wants for their product. The evaluation facility will write an extensive evaluation report, which is usually highly confidential, and will submit this report to a certification body. The certification body will verify whether the evaluation report is satisfying, and if it is, the certification body will issue a common criteria security certificate for the product. Most of the security certificates for smart card products are issued by just two certification bodies, that is ANSI in France and BSI in Germany. Interesting to note is that the task of the certification body ends with the issuance of a certificate. If later a flaw is found in a certified product, the certificate will not be revoked. The vendor is expected to apply for a new certification in this case, but nobody can force the vendor to do that. Um, it is important to note that here, uh, usually for smart card products, a composite evaluation is applied, meaning that first the chip is certified and then the software running on the chip. Uh, this means that if we decide to switch chips, we have to recertify our product because running the same operating system or smart card application on a different chip may not provide the same expected security. And this is related to the fact that when writing software for a chip, we may need to use specific software security measures that are provided by that specific chip to avoid side channels and fault injection attacks. Now, to summarize, this common criteria certification process provides some assurance about the security of a product. However, it cannot guarantee absence of vulnerabilities, as you may remember from the case of Infineon RSA key generation flaw, where the flaw was not discovered in the evaluation process. Let's move now to the second part of this lecture, where the topic is the Javacard technology. So, what is Javacard? 
Java Card is a smart card capable of running code written in the Java programming language. So there is a Java runtime environment present on the card. Actually, a very stripped down version of Java is used here. Most of the Java programming language features are not available. Java Card implements only the data types Boolean, Byte, and Short. Data types char, string, float, and int are not supported, so no floating point arithmetic. All the required functionality has to be implemented using these simple data types Boolean, Byte, and Short. Only one dimensional arrays are supported, and no threads are supported for quite obvious reasons. What we have, however, is a rich cryptography API that is available and can be called within a Java card applet. On the hardware level, this is usually implemented by employing a separate cryptographic coprocessor, for example, to perform modular exponentiation fast. The algorithm support depends on the specific card. While the Java card standard defines a large list of cryptographic algorithms, it is up to the chief vendor to decide which of these algorithms their product will support. Uh, here, in this link, there, the, there is a huge table showing which crypto algorithms are supported by the most popular Java card products. Uh, this database is maintained by Czech researchers, the same ones who found the flaw in Infineon RSA key generation algorithm. And they also provide some performance figures, benchmarks on how fast these algorithmic cryptographic operations can be performed by each card. Now, what is important for Java Card Applet developers is that hardware security, security against side channel attacks, is guaranteed only for the crypto API calls. If we do some manual processing or parsing of the private key or other secret data in Java Card code, we are not protected against side channel and other attacks. Therefore, it is recommended to not implement our own crypto, but to use as much as possible the functionality provided by the crypto API. And for this reason, Java Card API, for example, provides a PIN code verification routine so that we wouldn't have to implement it ourselves in Java. If we were to write some security critical code, we should ask the vendor of the platform what security guarantees it provides, whether, for example, the operations such as addition, multiplication are constant time or not. Maybe they are, but the vendor has to guarantee this protection only for the crypto API calls. Now, to get Java code into the card, the Java class files have to be first converted to the so-called cap file. So, first we have our Java source code files, then we compile them to a class files, which will contain bytecode, and then the bytecode has to be converted to a cap file, which will be loaded into the card. Uh, we will see how to do it in a few slides. Now, the role of the Java card technology cannot be underestimated because most of the smart cards today run Java card code. Most of the payment cards and mobile phone SIM cards today run Java applets uh, that implement the required functionality. Native code is used only by some very specific smart card applications where performance is crucial. The Java card technology is nice because it promotes competition. Before Java card platform got popular, we would have to choose a specific chip and then write software for it using the vendor-specific programming language for the vendor-specific chip hardware. Now we can implement the required functionality as a Java card applet and run it on any Java card platform. The platform can be chosen based on price, performance, and Java card API features that it provides. If a better Java card platform comes out, we can move to a new platform, avoiding significant redevelopment costs. Uh, let's look at an example Java card applet. The functionality of this applet is very simple. The terminal asks for some random bytes, the applet generates them on the card and retur returns them to the terminal. For example, if the terminal sends this command APDU, the card will return three random bytes and the status word 9000, which stands for success. So here we are sending one data byte in this data byte specifying how many random bytes the terminal wants from the card, which is three here. And the card then returns these three bytes. Simple enough, right? We will call this applet test applet, and here follows the Java code that this file contains. Uh, first, we have to define some package name. Uh, we will name it AppCrypto in this case, 
and then we import some Java card specific libraries. Uh, then we have to define a class for our Java card applet. In this case, test applet. The class has to extend the class applet. Uh, this is a Java card specific class. Uh, then we define a variable RND of type random data. Uh, this variable will store a pointer to the random number generator object. Uh, then we have to define the method install. Uh, this method is invoked when a cap file is installed on the card, so this method is called only once. Uh, what it does here is it simply registers the applet in the list of applets available on the card. Uh, then we can have a constructor. It is not required to have it, but as you see, the install method calls the constructor, so we can use it to initialize some variables and do some other operations which we have to or which have to be done only once. As you see, here we initialize the random number generator. Then the most important method is the process method that receives an APDU as an argument. So whenever the terminal sends some command to the card, the process method is invoked. This process method has to process the APDU and send back to the terminal some response. Um, we have to call the getBuffer method on the APDU object to get the pointer to the byte array which contains the APDU. Now, after this line is executed, the buff array will contain only the command APDU header, the first five bytes of the received APDU. Uh, now we can analyze this header to decide what to do with this APDU. For that, we can use the switch statement. Uh, we could also use a bunch of if statements, but a switch statement is more convenient here. Uh, what we do here is that we look inside the buff array second element, which corresponds to the APDU's instruction byte. Uh, we could also write here one, but we are using some defined constants for readability, so this offset ints corresponds to byte constant one. In case the instruction byte is zero, we check whether parameter 3 length contain, contains value 1, because we expect the terminal will send us only one data byte. If it contains a value other than 1, we throw an exception, which will return some status word, which corresponds, or which means, data invalid. Now, if it is 1, if the terminal sends us one data byte, we call the setIncoming and receive method. This method will send the procedure byte to the terminal and read the number of bytes specified in parameter 3 length contained. In our case, one byte. So after this call, the buff will have an extra byte. Uh, be careful, do not call this method if you do not expect to receive anything from the terminal. That is, if this is not a date APDU. Otherwise, the card will wait, and the terminal will wait, and the communication will time out. Next, we want to read the integer value specified in that one data byte. We do it like this. Uh, what we do here is we cast it to short and assign that value to variable len of data type short. Short is an integer data type that stores two bytes. Now, this bit masking with FF here is very important. Remember, this is Java. Here, the bytes are signed. If we do not do this masking and the byte value is larger than 127, we will get a negative value here. So we want to get rid of the sign, and this is how we do it. Uh, this must be kept in mind whenever using byte values. The previous generation Estonian ID card had a bug here. If we were to send more than 127 bytes to sign, it will return an error, because the signature length will be interpreted as a negative number, and signing will fail. Well, I have not seen the source code of the Estonian ID card applet, because it's not public, but it pretty much looks like this type of sign error. So don't make the same mistake in your code, okay? And next, we have to generate len number of random bytes. This is how we generate len number of bytes, and you write the generated random bytes in array buff, starting from offset zero. Then we call the method send outgoing and send, specifying offset zero and the length len. This method will send, return to the terminal, len number of bytes stored in the APDU buffer at offset zero. So you see, to send back some data, we have to put the data in the same APDU buffer we used for reading the data. 
Then finally, we return from the process method. By default, the status word 9000 will be returned. Uh, here, outside the switch statement, we will throw an exception that will return the status word that corresponds to instruction not supported. So this exception will be thrown for APDUs that have an instruction byte other than zero. And this is it. Uh, this is a complete, fully functional Java card applet, which fits on a single slide. So you can use this code to obtain random numbers for whatever reason you may need them. For example, uh, maybe you don't trust the pseudo-random number generator built into your operating system. Uh, you could then use a smart card to get, hopefully, true random numbers. Uh, smart card chips usually have a built-in light diode, which generates truly random bits. Uh, this is at least what the vendor says. Now let's compile and convert this Java card source code to a CAP file that can be loaded into a smart card. Uh, first, let's install three packages. OpenSC, OpenJDK8, Java Development Kit, and AND. Uh, note that it is important to use JDK version 8 here. If you have other versions installed, you may run into weird error messages, so make sure you don't have any other JDK versions installed. Uh, then let's download Ant Java Card and Oracle Java Card software development kits. Uh, then we have to create a build file, which is an Ant XML project file. Uh, here is how this project XML file should look. The JC kit parameter here must specify which Java Card software development kit to use when building the applet. Uh, we are using Java Card SDK 222 because this is the Java Card standard that is supported by the cards uh, which we'll use. So this will allow us to use in our code the API features of Java Card standard 222. Usually we can specify a lower API version than the card supports, but not higher. The output parameter specifies where to write the cup file and the sources parameter specifies where our Java source files, which you want to build, are stored. It is very important that there are no other unrelated sources in this directory or any subdirectories, because uh, for some strange reason, the tool will try to build them also, and the whole process will fail. In the class parameter, we specify the name of our package and the name of the class. The EID here in hex is the applet identifier of our package. Uh, this is how our applet will be identified on the card. It has to be unique. Now, once the project file is ready, uh, we have to just execute ant in the directory where our build XML file is stored. And if everything is successful, the applet.cap file will be produced. Very good. Now, how do we get this cap file into the card? There is a standard called global platform which is a standard for applet management on Java cards. It describes how to manage applets on Java cards. The idea is that multiple applets can be installed on one card. An applet is selected by the terminal using the select file command specifying the applet identifier, AID, of the applet. An applet can be set as the default applet, selected by default. If the applet is set as the default applet, it will be the one which is automatically selected when the card is powered. If the applet is not the default applet, it has to be explicitly selected by the terminal using the select file command. Applets are isolated, meaning that an applet cannot access data of other applets and cannot communicate with other applets unless the applet explicitly implements shareable interface. So this is for security, because applets could be written by different entities and we don't want them to intervene with each other. Usually applets can be deleted, for example, to free space for other applets, but they can never be downloaded. And this again is for security reasons. Uh, then there is a concept called security domain, SD. Every applet has to belong to a specific security domain. A card issuer security domain, ESD, is the main security domain on the card. The ISD is always on the card. The card issuer can create supplementary security domains, SSDs. To authenticate a security domain, a secure channel protocol has to be used using symmetric or isometric keys. 
So the idea is that the card issuer can create supplementary security domains for other parties, give them keys, and in this way these other parties could manage applets under their security domain on their own. So this provides isolation between application providers. Pretty neat feature. In the context of Estonian ID card, there are plans to open the card for third-party applets, so that applets developed by third parties could be installed on the, on the ID card. The plan is to have some kind of ID card play store, uh, which you see here, where it would be possible to download and install applets onto an ID card. Uh, this, of course, uh, would be possible only for applets that have been checked and confirmed by the card issuer, the Estonian state. Unfortunately, lately, there hasn't been much progress to implement this idea in practice. Now, to install a cap file into a card, we have to send several global platform commands to the card over a secure channel. We will use the tool called Global Platform Pro. Make sure you download this specific version of the tool. Newer versions may work a bit differently and may not handle the smart cards we will work with. Uh, this tool is developed by Martin Paljak from Estonia. Uh, he has done a great job by implementing most of the features from the global platform specification. Before this tool was available, you would have to use this chip vendor's proprietary binary script to install something on their card. Today, this tool is used all over the world. It is common to see smart card vendors recommending the use of this tool to manage applets, and we will also use it. We can install our applet on a card using a single command. Here, we specify the name of the cap file and specify the default argument to install the applet as the default selected applet on the card, such that we would not have to run the select applet identifier command before sending data to our applet. Uh, this applet uh, will be installed under the issuer security domain. If the keys for the issuer security domain are not specified in the command line, then the tool uses the default dummy keys. Uh, make sure you don't pass any keys there. If you try to authenticate to the issuer security domain several times using wrong keys, the card access to the issuer security domain may get blocked, effectively breaking the card. So please don't try any keys on the card that you will use. If the applet installation was successful, it will print cap loaded. Uh, now we can list the applets installed on our card by passing the list argument to the tool. And here we should see our applet which has the status default selected. And here we see the package from where it was installed. So the idea is that the cap itself is a package, and from this package we can install several instances of the applet. Each applet will have a different AID, but the first five bytes of the ID will match the AID of the package or the cap file. Uh, now we can use the OpenSC tool to send from the command line some arbitrary AP due to the card. Uh, here we send the AP due to our applet to get five random bytes. And we get them. These are these five random bytes, and this is the status word. Here we ask for 160 random bytes, and we get them. Very good. Everything works. Now, how to delete the applet? To delete the installed package together with the applet, we can use this command. So this will delete the package that has this EID, and the delete depths argument will delete the associated applets as well, okay? For the homework, uh, you should have been given a blank Java card which you'll be able to program. Uh, this Java card platform is known as Infineon JTOPS 78 and this is the product code. What is interesting about this platform is that this is the same platform that is used in the previous generation Estonian ID cards, the cards that were issued until the end of 2018, and which is affected by Infineon RSA key generation flaw. Uh, here is the specification. It runs Infineon slash 78 security microcontroller and has 150 kilobyte hard disk. How large is the RAM? I don't know. I was not written in the specification. Should be a few kilobytes. The card complies to Java card standard 304, and as you can see, supports AES256, SHA512, RSA 2048, and ECC keys up to 384 bits. Uh, this Java card platform has passed common criteria level 5 plus security certification, but unfortunately, the security certification was not able to discover the flaw in the implemented RSA key generation algorithm. So be warned, the RSA key generation as implemented by the card generates weak keys that can be factorized. 
Now, what do you think is the market price for this card? Usually, the price of the card depends on the functionality, the speed of the chip, and the number of chips that we are being purchased. If you order in big quantities, you can get a very cheap price. For example, the chips used in payment cards and SIM cards cost almost nothing, because these chips don't require asymmetric crypto that would require a power from a controller. Uh, these cards were bought for 6 euros piece, and this is a pretty cheap for this specification. Most likely the price is so low now due to the RSA key generation flaw that was discovered in it. Anyhow, I expect to receive the card back from you once you are done with the homework. Uh, just for information, you can also get your hands on this Java card platform. Uh, this is a Chinese vendor's uh, Feitian card that has a somewhat uh, lower specification, but it has a contactless interface as well. So, if you want to experiment with this card, you can get it. An interesting feature is that the Java Card virtual machine on this platform has a garbage collector. But it is a very simple one, as it is invoked only after the card has run out of memory. And this platform has not passed any security certifications. And probably because of that, the on-card random number generator is totally flawed. So, there is a bold warning for this platform on-card random number generator is flawed. Um, here you can see the random data returned by the card. As you see, it is hard to not notice that this does not look like random data at all. And you would see a very similar pattern if you looked at the RSA public key generator on this platform. So something is very wrong with the built-in random number generator. The price for this card was 5 euro, but uh, probably it can be purchased uh, much cheaper in larger qualities, quantities. So the homework task is to implement a Java card applet. Write a Java card applet that performs on-card RSA 2048-bit key generation and decryption. Uh, there is the test applet.py script that is provided in the course repository. What you have to do is implement the Java card applet on the card side. When running this test applet.py, it will initiate RSA key generation on the card and will print out how much time it took to generate the key. Uh, here it shows 15 seconds, but don't be surprised if this time is very different for you as the RSA key generation process is probabilistic. And if you're lucky, the key can be generated also in one second, for example. Uh, next, it will download the public key from the card and print out the 2048-bit module SEN and the public exponent 65537. Uh, then it will ask the user to enter some message to be encrypted using this public key. Here we enter it. And, of course, this message cannot be longer than the module size here. Uh, next, the message is encrypted, and the ciphertext is sent to the card for decryption. The message is decrypted on the card, and the plaintext is returned and printed out. Uh, obviously, it has to match the plaintext we entered. Implement this functionality in a Java card applet, and commit the test applet.java file to your repository. So, how to implement the applet? Uh, find out the communication protocol, the format of APDUs, from the test applet.py file, which is in the course repository. Uh, here are the Java card API calls that you should use. To generate an RSA key, use this code. Uh, this is how we can create a key pair object. In the first parameter of key pair, we specify the algorithm, in this case, alg RSA. And in the second parameter, the length of the key, 2024 or 2048 bits. The method gen key pair will perform the key generation. To get the public key, use the method get public. And then you can use get exponent and get modulus methods to get the exponent and modulus. Uh, here specify where to write the key bytes and here at what offset. To decrypt RSA ciphertext, you have to get instance of the RSA PKCS1 algorithm. Initialize it using the private key in the mode decrypt. The method do final will do the actual decryption. Here you specify input buffer and input offset and length of the ciphertext. Here the output buffer and offset where the plaintext should be written. This do final method will return the number of plaintext bytes that were written into the output buffer. So that is how you can find the length of the plaintext. As you know, 
the size limit for the data APDU body is 255 bytes. However, the ciphertext for 2048-bit RSA will be 256 bytes large. So, how to send it to the card? One idea would be to split the ciphertext into blocks and send them to the card using several APDUs. However, it would be good to fit these 256 bytes in one APDU. The trick is to use P1 and P2 to send that data. So, the first two bytes of the ciphertext are, amended, are embedded in P1 and P2. The rest are in the APDU data field. To decrypt ciphertext, make the ciphertext continuous. It will not be continuous because you will have an extra byte in the middle, parameter 3 or length contained. Uh, one way to make it continuous is to use this function to copy slices of one array to another. Or you can simply move P1 and P2 one position further to get a continuous ciphertext in the APDU buffer. Okay? Your code has to avoid memory leaks and EEPROM wear. I will talk about uh, this on the next slide. But the general recommendation is to initialize objects stored in EEPROM only once and don't write into EEPROM without a need. How to know when you are using EEPROM, I will explain on the next slide. Uh, then make sure that the key pair is generated only once. Ignore, without error, repeated key gen requests. So if you run testapplet.py twice, the second time key generation will take zero seconds, because the, because the key generation will not be performed. Okay? Remember, Java has signed data types. You have to cast by to short using ffmask to get rid of sign. And then debugging is possible only where the data or status word returned. You cannot print out something on the screen, so forget about using println statements. The card has no screen to show you your printed output. To understand at which line your applet crashes, throw an exception with specific code, or simply comment out line by line to see at which line the smart card fails. I hope you get the idea. Now, regarding the memory management in Java card, uh, you have to realize that there are two storage mechanisms. The first is EEPROM, or flash in the newer cards. So this is the hard disk. The write operations are very slow, and there is actually a physical limit of how many times you can write to EEPROM or flash cell. However, uh, you have to write data in EEPROM if you need to preserve it on power loss. In all other cases, you should not touch EEPROM, but use random access memory or RAM. Now, RAM provides very fast writes, even up to a thousand times faster than in EEPROM, but the data is lost on card reset and RAM is usually just a few kilobytes. So you should avoid using EEPROM for handling temporary data. Use RAM as much as possible for speed and to prevent wear of EEPROM. So how can you know when your Java card code uses EEPROM and when RAM? The persistent objects stored in EEPROM are cross-member variables, those which you define directly under the class, not inside the methods. Then static variables, if you use the keyword static between variable definition, and array data. So any arrays you define, they by default get allocated in EEPROM. The transient objects, on the other hand, are local variables defined inside the method, method parameters, and arrays which are created using the special function make transit byte array. So this function will allocate array in RAM. The APDU buffer is a global transient data array. So you can use the APDU buffer as a temporary buffer to, to make sure that EEPROM is not being used. Note that a garbage collector is not present in Java Card Runtime environment. So the space of unreferenced objects is not reclaimed. As I mentioned, some cards have a garbage collector, but it kicks in only when the card has run out of memory. Only then it will go and see if this allocated data is referenced somewhere, and if it is not, then it will clear it. So, make sure that your code does not redefine persistent objects in each call of the process method. This will create a memory leak, which will eventually lead to an out-of-memory condition. Your applet must be able to export keys and decrypt data millions of times without problems. Uh, your solution will not receive full points if it has a memory leak. So keep in mind these memory management issues. Okay? Now, you can write uh, Java card code in your favorite text editor, but you can also use Eclipse in case you want to see code validation and read Java card API function documentation. Uh, 
Uh, however, there are a few steps that you have to do to, per, uh, to configure Eclipse because the standard installation of Eclipse does not know anything about Java card. It knows only about Java. So what should you do? Uh, you should create a Java project as you would usually do. Uh, the result, you should see something like this. Now, to get a Java card code validation and completion, you have to specify the jar file from the Oracle SDK 222. So, follow these steps. As the last thing, uh, we want to add a javadoc resource to be able to see the documentation of our Java card API functions and their parameters. Uh, you have to specify simply here this URL to the javadoc location path. Uh, this will enable javadoc for Java card API calls. Uh, so you will be able to read the API documentation by hovering the mouse over the function. Okay? Okay. Perfect. Uh, with this, we finish this lecture. Good luck with the homework.